darkness falls on New York City, and a small, sun-bleached taxicab slowly makes its way through its geometric streets. Lights shining from any place of entertainment. You would think that the alcohol ban of Prohibition would have put a real dampen on the party atmosphere of some of these places, but it's almost as if Washington's laws don't stop the city that never sleeps. People go here and there, off to parties, to functions, ready to get relaxed and have a lot of fun. Now, whether alcohol is involved, no one's really going to say. In this taxi cab sits two newly minted allies, and not entirely who you would expect. One from the old world, one from the new. So let me get this straight, Mr. Race. You are a part of this government delegation here to negotiate with our people and your part in the team is to play a sort of what Sherlock Holmes you know I was never particularly a fan of that Conan Doyle nonsense I found that all of his plots were overly convenient in my experience real life is never quite as straightforward in your experience Right, and this is the part that you start to tell me that all my years of experience on the police force come to diddly squat compared to your worldly wiseness. I think there's some value in the gifted amateur, don't you? Mr. Ace, we have a lot of very gifted amateurs in the police department in New York as it is. We don't need another one of your kind poking around and causing mischief. A colonial accusing a Brit of causing mischief. Now that's the pot calling the kettle black if I said so. See, that's always the problem with you armchair detectives. You always deal in stereotypes. Oh, you're a Brit. Oh, I'm a colonial. And you always just keep it as simple as that. Then what would you say gets you through your investigations, Miss Bartney, as one of the few up-and-coming talented female police detectives? Don't tell me that it's woman's intuition. Okay, Mr. Race, you're very quickly making me dislike you. I highly recommend you take keep those sort of comments to yourself, if you don't mind. Ah, I do apologize, Miss Barney. I did go too far there. And you are right. The stereotype, the cliche, they're the lazy detective's way out. Ultimately, investigation is hard work. Patience, intuition. I'm not particularly good at those things, in all honesty, but when those things do stall, because they do stall occasionally, they can use from a little push someone to come along and upset the apple cart before you put all the apples back again. I find that I have a certain talent for keeping things random and unexpected. Well, I'd appreciate that you keep your randomness to a minimum as best you can. Remember, if there's get into any trouble, I'm going to be in it with you. And I will be watching you. Understood, Miss Bartney. Hello and welcome to The Big Dry. This is a solo RPG based on the Iron Swan system. Um, but unusually, it is a mystery series in which... We're essentially investigating scenes and rolling up pieces of evidence, rolling our conversations and seeing what comes. The real trick in this investigation is my ability and our ability, if you're playing along at home, to put those pieces together into a cohesive story, a cohesive solution to the crime. In that way, we get to play detective. Thank you so much for tuning in again. My name is Evan. I will be the player for today. If you haven't seen any of the previous episodes, can I encourage you to go back and give them a watch. Um, I'll only give a brief wrap-up of what's happened so far, so if you want all the de juicy details, go back and watch those episodes. In addition, some of the rules will come across. I I'll give a brief explanation, but all the in-depth stuff was in earlier episodes. But thank you again for joining us, and let's get into it. So our sleuth is David Race, who's in New York at the very dawn of Prohibition. He's investigating the brutal murder of a Mr. Templeton, a, a British government diplomat. In the last episode, he made his way injured to the central police hub in New York City, hoping to find information, firstly, 
race was able to access the police's own information on what they were able to discover at the crime scene. And some of it really does shift a lot of what we've discovered so far. We discovered that there was a, a false bottom and an extra set of keys to the room, though what it's doing in the, in the room and not being used outside of the room, I don't know. There was also signs that in the vent, there was a bottle of like sleeping drug that had been set up so that when the aircon was turned on, the room would be filled with this sleeping stuff. And they did find um, that uh, Templeton's body showed signs that this specific sleeping drug had been in his system when he died. We also got uh, the witness testimony of the next door neighbor, someone who was a bit of a, a bit of a nosy person. They heard noise. They, they wanted to see what was going on. And they saw a known figure to us, well, sort of known figure to us, uh, entering and leaving the crime scene. This figure was the shaved headed woman who we don't even know her name yet. All we know is that she is an artist that um, uh, briefly worked for the hotel, you know, installing an art piece, uh, but also was the person who uh, one of Templeton's colleagues saw talking to him the night that he died, giving him some information and, and he didn't was very hush hush about that. Well, she was later seen, as I said, entering and exiting the crime scene in a disheveled state was the witness's uh, account. Interestingly though, uh, we did see signs in the crime scene of a struggle, but this person says that while they were there, they heard no signs of heard no signs of arguing or fighting or anything like that. They went in, they went out, and that was it. But probably even more significantly than those pieces of evidence, we've got ourselves a new character. Miss Harriet Bartney is an undercover female police detective. She is very astute, and she's got a bit of a bee in her bonnet regarding the rich and powerful in New York getting away with all sorts of things. And so a lot of David Race's little tricks didn't quite work on her. But she is ambitious. She really wants to actually make waves in the detective scene. And she's not really being allowed to, of course, because sexism, basically. And so she now sees that David Race is someone that she could use in order to try and get more access to this significant murder case. And of course, David Race sees her as someone that he can use for information in this investigation. Now, in order to sort of simulate what uh, having her coming along in this story will be like, we're going to use something from the Iron Sworn series, a feature of the Iron Sworn series. Iron Sworn, created by Sean Tompkins, a great game. It's free. So go and have a look yourself. But now that we've got her on board, there were two assets that took uh, my attention that, that might help us uh, simulate what it's like having um, Miss Bentney uh, tagging along with us. Now, last, one, last week I mentioned one of them, and that was the Pretender card. Now, the Pretender card, we're going to do our own version of it. We're not going to follow it exactly, um, but basically she's going to be following us. Now, she's under the impression that race is a part of the official delegation from England, that he is investigating on behalf of, of the government. This is not entirely true. Um, yes, he, he, was, he was brought in uh, accidentally, and they, they have let him continue to investigate, but he's, he's definitely not an official member of the government. So he's lying to her. He's based the beginning of their partnership on a lie. They're basically, as they're both investigating together, if, if they're together, and at some point um, race rolls a one on the skill dice, okay, a natural one on the skill dice, then uh, basically Bartney will start being like, yeah, this guy's not who he says he is, and I'm starting to get a bit sick of his, his attitude. Uh, what uh, race will then have to do is he'll have to roll some other move to try and cover for himself. If he succeeds, it's fine. The, the pretense will continue. If he doesn't, then, I don't know, we'll find out what happens. But basically, it won't be good for their partnership, their relationship. I also thought we'd use this other asset, which is the companion asset. So it's the kindred card. Basically, what's going to happen is while this person's with you, so while Miss Bennett's with us, we're going to use uh, the skilled asset. Uh, when you make a move outside of combat, 
um, aided by your companion's expertise, you add an extra one to your role. So we're going to assume that she is a detective. She's a good detective. She's astute. Uh, we said last time it's not so much in forensics that she's an expertise. Um, it's more that she's very good at listening to people. She's very good at hearing when, uh, when, when there's like holes in their argument. She's, she's good as an orator. She's good at speaking to people. But also she's good at listening and going, mm, you said that, but that's not true. Those, those things don't connect. Again, this was bad for race, but he managed to make it work just. And now it's, you can, you know, basically have her as an ally to do similar things against people he's interrogating. Okay, so with that, let's kick into the story. Um, just for the sake of pacing, uh, I decided that what we'll do is we'll imagine that they have indeed jumped into a ca uh, taxi. They've gone back to the New York Hotel. Silly name, I know, but we're running with it. And they've inquired more about the shave-headed artist. We'll assume that they basically gave them an address that they're going to go to. We're going to roll to see how useful that address is, but that's where they're going now. They're making a way, their way to sort of the, the east side of New York. Um, I think it's the East Village. I can't remember. Um, and they're going to go to a sort of more artistic part of the world where they've got an address uh, about where she might be. We'll roll and find out what's there. So once again, we're going to jerry-rig the Iron Sworn rules to suit our purposes a little bit. So I apologize for the purists out there. We are going to make use of the reach destination roll. Basically, after doing the whole big journey, um, you roll the dice to see if you, you made it in one piece at the end of the journey or if the situation favors you at, at the other end of the journey. Okay, so we're not going to roll against a progress tracker because obviously we're not using that progress tracker in this journey. What we'll do is we'll use... David's heart, now, which is not necessarily a good thing because Race's heart is one, pretty low, but we'll make use of the kindred, okay? Um, as we're going into this part of town, um, we've got the address, we're going there and Miss Bartney, she's been here before, she's undercover cop, um, she's been in these parts to sort of just go into bars, get in and out and keep an eye on things. Um, they have the address, do they have her name? I think they would. The, they would have the hotel, um, if they've got the address of the artist, her, like, I guess her, well, we don't know what's at her address, um, but if they got her address, assumably they would have her name, wouldn't they? So let's roll for a name. So for names, um, I've been just using random books, not random books, I've been using Agatha Christie books. This one is quite a random Agatha Christie book. It is The Hound of Death, which uh, was one of the books she wrote when she was getting a bit sick and tired of writing crime fiction over and over again. They still got crime fiction elements, but ultimately she lent more into the sort of the gothic with these ones. Um, so let's roll, turn around the page, roll the dice. The third name on the page is Janet. They're using the name Janet. And here's another name just after that. Janet Mayhern. Janet Mayhern is the name that the hotel has for this shave-headed artist. So as they approach the address of this artistic Mayhern lady, they encounter what looks to be an apartment building, an apartment building that is savage in nature. It's not like completely crime ridden, but basically it's the kind of bohemian place you'd expect to find an artist. And they come up to this sort of, uh, this one set of buildings. It's only like two or three stories tall, this apartment block. And it looks savage. Like the windows are a bit broken. But also, like, there's, there's grass growing out of the sidewalk. Uh, there, on a few of the windows, there's some, like, barbed wire around them. Again, doesn't quite fit into the rest, it's the rest of the um, suburb. It's bohemian, so it's not, like, the safest place in the world. But it's, this looks, place looks kind of fortified, but, like, rushed fortified. Maybe windows a bit bored up or something. So... David Race and Bartney approach this place. They get out of the car. They look at the building. They get a sense of concern that they almost expect to find, I don't know, barbarians inside this place. So they approach the door and they knock. We're just adding the heart and adding the companion. So we're just adding two. So let's see what we get. We get, with a plus two, okay. Um, so... 
I rolled a five, uh, not five, I rolled a three plus two, five, versus a three and a seven. So on a weak hit, you arrive but face an unforeseen hazard or complication. Envision what you find. So what did they find? What did they find? We're going to roll on the Iron Sworn Oracles once again. We'll do action and theme to see what kind of complication they encounter. We've got an 11. Double's always scary. Break. Break. Break, break, break. Break Deception. 34. Break Deception. Is it something that jeopardizes Bartney and races very new relationship. I know what it is. Okay, so the way that Bartney and Race met, like we saw last episode, episode uh, Race was injured and he went into the ho uh, the the police station, claiming that it was this random Captain Darcy that got him. But of course, it wasn't Captain Darcy that shot at him. It was uh, Mark, the concierge, Mark the bellhop. He was the one that injured him. So, what if Mark Cauldron is there? But let's imagine it. They've pulled up in the taxi, they've paid the taxi, the guy doesn't want to stay there, so that they leave the money and, and he's like, oh, can you wait? Oh no, man, I've got, I've got things to do. So he, he drives off. I don't know why the taxi driver is Australian. I kind of do know why. As they're standing there, he looks off to the side and who should he see driving up, or what car should he see driving up the street but that lime green car that belonged to Mrs. Jenkins. If you don't get the reference, go back and watch the episode. You have got to be kidding me. What, what, what is it? No, no time to explain. Quick, in that alley, go. And so like that, race quickly bundles Miss Bartney into an alleyway off to the side. Um, he tries, he's going to keep trying to duck down and keep his head down. So we're going to try and like not be spotted by him. Maybe see if we can follow uh, Mr. Mark uh, Colden and see what's he doing here. So we're going to start this encounter with, with a face danger. Basically, um, Colden has pulled up. We're going to say he pulled up. Um, and we don't know if he's going into the building, if he's going to go down the street, like we don't know at this stage, um, but basically they're in the alleyway. Have they been spotted? Have they been able to keep their head down? Um, it's probably going to be likely, but we're going to face, we're going to face danger. So it's shadow, which is plus two. Um, not necessarily with the aid of Miss Bartney, because all of a sudden he's just been like, you know, no time to explain and ducked her into an alleyway. Um, so she's not helping per se, so it's basically just all race trying to deal with this. So that's a plus two to a roll. Let's see what we get. We get ourselves a five. So that's five plus two, seven versus a two and a ten. So it's a weak hit. It's a weak hit. So you succeed. We, we keep our head down, but you must suffer a troublesome cost. Okay. So because he's trying to like bundle... Um, Miss Bartney into this alleyway quickly. Um, we're going to say that uh, we, we lose a little bit of time. We suffer a bit of momentum loss and now down to three momentum, which is not going to help us out later if I want to want to fix a role uh, in the official rule set, fix a role. Um, so we're in this alleyway. We're hiding from Colden. We, we can see him. Does he go into the building? Oh, he has to. Come on, he's, he's here. He, it, it can't be a coincidence. So, but, but we're going to roll. We're going to roll. And we're going to see if it's a coincidence. Um, is he going into the building? I'm going to say that it's likely. It is likely, not guaranteed, but it is likely. We get ourselves a 27. So only just, um, yes, he does indeed make his way into the building. Colden makes his way up the stoop of this building. He he knocks at the door. There's a, there's a moment there. And Race carefully leans out to watch. He's, he's doing the best he can not to get noticed. And he doesn't because he's, you know, he's, he's done this sort of thing before. Um, and he sees that Colden heads inside. 
follow him. Basically, you're just going to follow him. Him and Miss Barney, they sort of make their way around. She's all like, okay, you, you need to explain a bit more than this. And I, I guess, oh, that's right. This is, this is going to be a threat to the deception. So he explains that he looks familiar. He's going to say to her that basically he, this guy looks familiar. Um, he, he, uh, I didn't see who attacked me, but, but that gentleman, he, he looks familiar. I saw him a couple of a time today as I was traveling around the place. I, it can't be a coincidence. So he, he's trying to convince her that, that he just looks suspicious. This is a bold-faced lie. And like we said, there's going to be a risk to their relationship. So it's a compel role. Um, I'm going to be using shadow on this. So does it work? Does it convince her that this is who they say it is? Okay, so that's a two, two, a four, which is six. It's a weak hit. It's a weak hit. So... She doesn't buy it. She's cluey, but she's curious. So she's going to go along with it. But let's be honest, she, she's really dubious as to what's going on. Probably not right now, but she's going to ask something of race later. She's going to want to know a bit more later. But right now, she's willing to play along. Okay, so they approach the door, and the door has shut behind him. Um, but they can hear some footsteps in the hall. Basically, we're heading into a stealth mission here. So I'm thinking what we actually might do is we're going to play this out a bit like a combat, but with an additional element. So we're saying it's the middle because, you know, they're sneaking in, but they're not expected. Uh, however, this place not only is uh, Mark Cal Calden, Calden, I'm saying that wrong all the time, I apologize. Uh, not only is he in there, uh, but also this place is savage. Like it's, it's, it is boarded up. It is run down. There's some barbed wire in the wind though. So... There's a certain level of fortification to this place, just, just in general. So they're going to be trying to sneak in at a formidable level. Um, so that's that's the normal uh, situation with any sort of enter the fray situation. Um, but instead of just, just straight up uh, clashing and striking at a distance or up close, we're going to use the idea that uh, we can choose some things or try to, try to use the pew pew rule set basically. Um, if they're hidden, we'll be using stuff like shadow. If we're on the move, we'll be using edge, that kind of thing. So depending on the context of what they're doing to hide and sneak will depend on what stat that we're going to be using uh, to roll. But also, uh, in some of the expansions for Iron Sworn, they have something called a threat roll, where basically if you get a poor roll, if you get something that doesn't allow you to advance your situation, uh, you then roll on a separate table that basically decides... Um, this, that, that someone's following you, someone's pursuing you. Now, no one's pursuing us right now, but we're going to say that this, that Mark uh, Calden and maybe anyone else who's in there, they're in there and they're looking around. And if they find someone sneaking around, they're gonna, they're gonna know about it. So basically, as my progress meter is filling, as we sneak around this building, we're trying to find something useful. I'm going to say, um, that threat is going to be in the background. Anytime we, we do, we miss a roll. We're going to see if anyone notices us using the advanced threat uh, rule set. So let's do this. Let's say that they're entering into the fray. They're looking for a way in. Um, they look at the front entrance, but they're also going to be willing to look around the side to see if they can find a way in. So we're going to be rolling uh, a shadow for this. They're moving at the moment unaware. So plus two, uh, plus two to a four and a 10, which is a miss. But I've got to be honest with you, right now, because I'm doing a whole bunch of stuff, I don't want to miss. We're going to use a fudge token. Basically, $2 to charity for a slight fudge. We'll bump it up one, we'll just say it's a weak hit. Um, we can either choose to take momentum or take initiative. Let's take initiative. So Race and Bartney move around to the fire escape. Uh, it's up there. They can see that even though the whole place is fortified, uh, there's, little, there's some windows that aren't. And they notice on one of the levels of the fire escape, there is an unfortified window. So maybe they'll be able to sort of move some uh, garbage bins around. Maybe they can jump up and try and get the fire escape uh, ladder, bring it down so that they can get up there. So we're going to say that's an edge roll. Um, 
Edge is two for for um, race. Barney's helping him out, help him out with this, so we can probably add another one for that and say that it's a plus three. Three to a three is a six, and we got a double five, so it's a strong hit. He does so. He he manages to to with her age. He's like holding. Uh, no, he's the one holding the bin. Um, she sort of climbs up on that bin. This isn't her first rodeo. She knows these fire escapes and she knows just how to just spring herself up, get that to bring the ladder down and do so quietly. She comes down, lands on her feet perfectly. Um, she manages to get a strong hit on that strike. So quietly making their way up the fire escape, Bartney leading the way, they get to that window. Um, Race peeks in the window just softly, just quietly looking around the corner. Um, and we do a plus two to a four, which is six, against a one and a three. So it's a strong hit again, strong hit on a strike. They look into the room and no one's there. Um, the room, let's just say it's a, a lounge room. Let's just say it's sort of a lounge room type setup, um, but no one's in there. Again, that savage theme. The place is a bit run down. It's lived in. It's very lived in, but not very well kept. So, the, so they make their way into the room, sneaking as they go. Um, they, no one's in there, like we said. Um, they very carefully open the door. They head out to the hallway because they know that Mark is down the stairs. So once again, they very quietly look over the edge of the stairs to see what they can see. So it's a plus two to a four against an eight and a three. It's a weak hit. So they look down the, the stairwell um, that's out in the main uh, apartment building and they can see Mark, but he's coming up the stairs. In fact, he's coming up to this very floor. So he's coming up the stairs. What are they going to do? I don't know. I'm a little bit panicked. Um, they could go back into the room. Uh, in this hallway, it's a normal hallway. It's a smallish apartment building. There's probably not going to be a corner around to another apartment. Stop it. They're going back into the room they came from. They'll look through the little keyhole. So they're going to go back into the room. Um, we're going to move, try to move quickly and quietly. So it's probably not quite shadow. It's more like edge, which is a plus two. They move into the room. <gasps> We rolled a one. So, okay, so we rolled a one. So two to that one um, against, so that's three, against a five and a four, which means it's a miss. It's a miss. It's a bad thing. Okay, so it really is the worst possible kind of roll. Not only is it a weak hit, but it's a one. It's a one, which means we're going to be able to do something that's going to make Miss Barney question um, race and who he is and his ability. Look, what I'm thinking is they go to the door and they, they grab the handle to go inside the room, but the door's locked. Like they, they went out in the room into the stairwell, they, they, they went into the hallway to look down the stairwell and it locked. And as race drastically jiggles the, hall, uh, the, the door and just to, to get in and finds it's locked, Barney looks up and said, are you some kind of idiot? You came out the door last just then and you left it locked like like what kind of moron are you you're, you're supposed to be the smart detective so at this stage because we're in the middle of this sort of scenario it's just a seed of doubt in her mind again she this is all stuff they're gonna have to talk about later um but the door is locked no progress is made and we actually advance the threat so we roll our d10s i've got a number 47 47 means the Mark is still coming up the stairs and he can hear that jiggling. He, he doesn't immediately jump out at him as being something bad, but he can hear them. So we're going to advance the threat by one. So Race looks at Barney and quickly says to her, Quickly, you have to kiss me! And Barney says, Not in your life, buddy. Fair enough! So they don't do that cliche. Instead, they need to look for another way to, to get out of the situation. Okay, so I can't believe we're doing this. I'm assuming that this hallway has um, some, uh, this hallway in the apartment building has some windows at either end of it. Um, they make their way to that window. They're gonna try and see if they can open the window and the goal is to essentially bust a key in this thing. 
and see if they can climb out of the window to not be seen by Mark as he comes up the stairs. But are they quick enough? Let's find out. So we're rolling edge plus two. It's a six. So it's an eight against a seven and a three. They get to that window. The window is, they're able to unlock it and open it. Very unsafe, can I say, but 1920s. So they open it, they climb out. Indeed, there is a ledge. There's a little bit of space that they can climb out on and quickly pull themselves up and none too soon either. Mark comes up the stairs. So once again, peeking around the window to see if they can see him entering one of the rooms. Okay, so it's shadow, two to a three, five, against a five and a nine. Ties go to the challenge dice. It is once again a weak hit. As Race pokes his head around the corner, he looks and Mark just begins to look and look towards the window. The threat advances. We get a 79. Oh, it's a 79. So they advance by two. So we're, the threat is now up to three against our progress of five. Basically, if these two things become par uh, on parity, he's going to spot us. So basically, he pulls his head back just in time. Maybe. Did he see something? He looks, he second guesses, he's suspicious, but he keeps moving forward. They can't risk it again. They can't poke their head around the corner. They're just going to do their best to listen. They sit and they listen to see if they can hear any clues. So he's come up to this floor. He's, he's, he's on an apartment in one of these floors. They're going to see if they can try and hear if he gets quieter as he goes down the hall or gets noisier as he comes up the hall can knock on the door, voices, anything. So they're going to see if they can try and listen in to find out anything they can wit. So they're paying attention, they're using their wit, they're trying to figure out if they can hear anything. So it's a plus three to a five, that's seven, against a six and a two, it is a strong hit. So they do get something useful. Okay, so I'm thinking that uh, they hear the knocking at the door. Um, it does kind of sound maybe a little closer up the hallway so they're able to actually get a, they know that basically it's further up the hall they know that the apartment was somewhere between where they were the stairwell entryway and the window let's just say there's only literally just one apartment between there and there so they know what door uh what door that he's probably gone to is but he, they also hear a voice okay let's just say it's 50 is it like is it a male or female voice so is it a female voice 50 50 is it a female voice no it is not a female voice. They, they hear a voice, it actually doubles, so it's 33. So it's distinctively a male voice that they hear. They hear a male voice in this apartment block. So I'm assuming they hear the door close behind Mark as he enters this apartment, build, uh, apartment building. They, they're pretty sure that it's this apartment between the stairwell and the window where they are, just one there, they know where it is now. Do they go to the door? Or do they go check out maybe on the window? Do they Spider-Man this thing? So do they want to climb around the side to find out more? Oh, it's more exciting, isn't it? It's more exciting. They're going to Spider-Man this thing. So it's a plus two um, with their edge as they're sort of climbing along the side of the building. It's a six. So it's a six plus two. That's eight but against a two and an eight. So it's only a weak hit. It's only a weak hit. Look, inflict damage, but lose um, initiative. So they they, they sneak around. Um, there are handholds. So it's, it's not like a, a sort of, they're, they're, they're scraping along. They climb to a window, but they find, they lose initiative because they find that the windows are closed. Fundamentally, the windows, the, the blinds on the windows, they're closed. Hmm, very suspicious. Okay, so what do they do? Do they try to open one of these windows? Do they try to very quietly get one of these windows open? I mean, why would they be locked? It's a, it's a window way up. Can they get one of these windows open? So maybe the window's fortified. 
Okay, they, they could be trying to do open this window stealthily. They could be doing it with strength. But considering they're hanging off the side of the building, they're going to be doing it without falling there. They're looking down on the street. Uh, it's maybe just the alleyway. It's not the actual street itself that they're looking down at. But it's three stories down. One slip and it could all go wrong. So as they're trying to get this window open, they're very carefully not losing their handhold. They're going to be using agility to try and get this window open. Oh my gosh! So, two to a three, five against a six and a ten. This is bad. Okay, so this is what I'm picturing. They go to try and get this window to open. Again, let's make this exciting. Um, David's reached across. He's, he's, he's trying to lift this window. It's got to be, it's been boarded up. Remember, it's all savage and stuff. So that he's trying to like carefully and quietly get this board to come loose but just as he does the place is a bit run down and the the bit of masonry that he's using to hold on to comes away and he himself begins to tumble now as he's tumbling we're going to see if they're able to save themselves from this situation but we also need to advance the threat they're just outside the hanging outside this window um do they get, does all this get noticed? Okay, so 68, the rummaging is heard, but only, uh, maybe they misheard something. So the threat advances to four. So race is falling. Can he do something to save himself? We're going to roll for edge to see if he can catch himself. But of course... Bartney's there too. Um, she's probably the whole time saying, this is the stupidest thing we've ever done. Are you kidding me? This is the, you don't just hang out windows. This is New York City. You fall to your death if you do this kind of thing. What kind of village have you grown up in? But nonetheless, he convinced her to get out there in the first place. And now he's proving her right. He's falling. But of course she wants to save him. Of course she's going to save him. Um, she's not a monster. So it's, Edge uh, plus two plus she's assisting, so it's plus three to our roll. Okay, so three to a two, five against a two and a nine. It is a weak hit. So she does catch him just in time. She gets a better handhold on um, on the side of the building, and she gets uh, she just manages to grab his hand. They're hanging out over the suburb. Race is there like holding and she pulls him in quickly. She doesn't even bother to like to muck around on this. So they, they manage to get back onto the side of the building. But once again, it, it's a weak hit. It's a weak hit. So the threat advances. Uh, it advances just by one, just by one. So they can hear rummage. They're kind of like, bloody birds outside again. What's going, what's going on? So we still haven't really figured out how to get inside this place and figure out what's going on. All right. So we, we have to try this window just one more time. Just one more time to see if this will work. Um, let's say that this time, um, uh, like Barney's like, you've got to be kidding me. This we, we, we're getting, we, we nearly died here. And he's like, but this is the only way we're going to get in to find out more. They're, they're saying this all in whispered tones. So basically, um, this time, uh, Barney's going to be the one that's going to try and like get it open. Race is actually going to try and uh, get a better hold and hold her. So that way she can get two hands on this thing and try and open it up. Um, so once again, they're all hanging off this thing. So they're using their edge um, plus one because Barton is helping this time. Uh, let's see what we get. Uh, so that's a six against a five and an eight. So they get the window open. The window does indeed slide open. But they're not as quiet as they could be. They're not as quiet as they could be. 72. Which means, oh, it advances by two. So they hear the window slide open. They haven't noticed them yet. Like they haven't seen it. They just hear the window. So they hear a, what is that? Okay. So they're going to approach the window. Oh, what are they going to do? So, okay. So the bad guys approach the window and, uh, they heard it open. They're going to have a look. They're going to do the only thing that they can do. They're basically just going to do the press themselves against the wall and hope they don't get noticed. 
So it is a shadow. They're both just trying to keep themselves hidden. Bartney's not going to help in any way with this one. So it's just a shadow roll. So plus two. Oh, plus two to a six against an eight and a seven. Okay, so they're pressing against this wall. They hear the footsteps come to the window. They don't look out the window. They don't actually look out the window. Um, but they just sort of stay there. They wait there patiently. Um, it was a weak hit. So we advance the threat. Uh, 32. Oh, they know something's up. They know something's up. The, the track advances. They know something's up. The window wasn't open before. Now they don't get super like, oh, there must be therefore someone hanging on the side of the building. Because who would do that? They're just getting really on edge and they close the window once again. Don't bolt it, don't lock it, just close it like it was before. Okay, so they're on the side of the building. We've actually got 10 progress lined up now. So, uh, but they don't have advantage. So we're going to, as if this was a fight, we're going to try and turn the tide. We're going to turn the tide by doing something uh, quite risky. So we know that they're away from the window because they didn't notice it opening and stuff like that. They came up to the window. So they're, they're probably in the other room. So we're going to try and turn the fire, uh, turn the tide. We're going to do something really risky. They're going to, once again, the window has been open, so it's all a bit loose now. They're going to try and quietly and quickly open the window. And in one swift movement climb into the room and try and find some sort of furniture to hide behind they're going to go in and they're going to try and eavesdrop so that's how we're going to finish this stealth mission smoothly getting into the room hide behind the couches to try and eavesdrop so that's how we're going to turn the tide so it's stealth um, in this turn of tide, it's then a plus one, so it's a three, as they use every bit of stealthiness they can. Three to a against a, a, on top of a four, so that's seven against a four and a seven. So it's a weak hit. Um, they succeed. Um, they succeed. I wouldn't say that it's with deafness and grace, but they do manage to get the window open and they quickly get into the room. It's a kitchen. Um, there's not really any furniture in this room per se they can hide behind, maybe a fridge. And, but it's next to the, the countertops, they can't really hide behind that. But there are, there's like a little alcove door thing. Um, so they're able to sort of come up to the sides of those and lean against it. Basically, what they're going to do now is try and eavesdrop. They're going to try and eavesdrop this conversation. So let's finish this stealth mission to see if they can get anything that's worth listening to. It's against a 10. So we've got the, the progress bar is completely filled against the challenge dice. Okay. Okay. It's a 3 and a 9. So it was almost a weak hit, but it's a strong hit. So we, we managed to succeed. We're in the room. They haven't noticed us. Let's gather some information, shall we? So because um, it was a strong hit, it's a strong success on that little mini stealth mission we just did, um, we're going to say that they uh, are in a position to eavesdrop the conversation. They're just going to hear a conversation. They'll listen to whatever they can in this conversation. We're going to use the Iron Swan uh, oracles once again. What's the conversation they're overhearing? It's between Mark and this unknown other person we haven't seen their face we just heard their voice we just know it's a male so what are they talking about they're talking about a void they're a void a void a void hate avoid hate they're having a conversation about avoiding hate Oh. Barney and Race sit with their backs against the wall and they're listening to the conversation. Now, Race has very negative feelings towards uh, Mark for obvious reasons. But the conversation he begins to hear from these two individuals takes him a bit by surprise. 
Listen, old bean, we, we, we just got to keep our heads together. We got to keep our cool. We'll be fine. How can you say that I will be fine? How can you say that I will be safe? In this country, I came here because I thought I would find a safe refuge. But instead, I find the same fears that I was running from from my own home. And I know that. I understand that you've gone through hell to get here, but you just got to trust me with what's going on. You told me that it was only rabble over here that hated my kind. It's only rabble over here that I needed to be afraid of. But it's more than that. The very people in power in this city hate us. The very people in this, this city who have power have control over our life and death. You, I, I'm not safe here. I am doing all I can to keep you safe. I am doing everything I can to keep you safe. And our mutual friend is too. You got to understand, she's under a lot of pressure in what we're trying to achieve here. She's under a lot of pressure. She's under a lot of pressure. It is my life that's on the line here. I, I escaped my country, my home, where I grew up because of these, these disgusting, hateful people who just hate me because of who I am. So, no, I, I, I mean, how do I know she even knows what it feels like to be me? Does she know what it's like to be this mysterious person 50 50 51 you know that she knows better than anyone what it's like to be in your shoes so look just sit tight stay calm we're going to sort this out you just got to trust us all right look we'll be back again later uh, We'll give you any information we can, but right now you just need to sit tight. So please keep you calm, keep you cool, and make sure you keep your door locked. Okay, so with that, the two figures then uh, leave the room. They go to the door, and as this movement's happening, they also go back to the window, quietly make their way out of it, quietly close it, and make their way back along the, the window edge. They very carefully make their way along the edge to the window that they came out of in the first place. They don't even check, they just wait. They just wait like five minutes uh, and then they open, they look and they open up the window and they climb in. They make their way to the staircase, they go down the stairs, they do the best to look like they belong. There actually are a few people coming back and forwards, but again, they're just doing the best to look like they belong there. They make their way to the front door and they head out the front door and then down the street to try and get some distance between them and the apartment before anyone realized what happened. So they make their way down the street. Um, again, getting as far away from the apartment building as they can, they, they find a little diner, uh, uh, it's open late. Um, again, pretty bohemian, pretty rustic. Um, but they go in, they sit down in a booth and they're licking their wounds. But of course, we know that Bartney has some questions. Well, I must say, I didn't expect to find myself hanging off New York's skyline so readily as we did tonight. Thank you so much for the save, by the way. For the save tonight? We mean the save tonight. There are at least five occasions where I saved your ass. Just, well, I'm not sure if that strong language is quite warranted, but I do appreciate your help, of course. My, my help, my help. What are you talking about? Like, we... We did something really reckless and stupid just then. You claim to be some sort of government official. Do government officials from the UK so readily throw their lives on the line like that? She's like kind of realizing that this guy is not really on the up and up. Um, climbing on windowsills. I mean, what, what's that? What is that? That's not investigations. That's some silly RPG nonsense. So she's really frustrated. She's really beginning to think, who is this guy? He's just some daredevil nut. Whether he's government or not, he's not going to be helpful in the further investigation. So what is Race going to do? What's he going to do to try and fix this? We're going to go a compel. Basically, Race is going to he's going to throw it back in her face a little bit. It's probably not going to work out very well, but but that's what that comes to mind. They just overheard a conversation where someone was very afraid of people in power in New York. 
So we're going to try and throw it back in her face a little bit. Look, I am not an expert on government officials. And yes, my behavior may have been fairly reckless. But from what I'm to gather from that conversation we just overheard, American officials don't seem to be much better. I mean, what's all this nonsense about avoiding hatred, that those in power uh, hate and fear their own members of the population? Are threats of death, I mean, for crying out loud. This isn't the first time, let's be honest. You Americans aren't exactly famous for being welcoming a lot, despite the fact that you're a migrant country. So you can challenge me all you like, but you yourself must know that your organization that you stand for has a lot to answer for. Did that work? Did that work? Um, was he able to sort of misdirect things a little bit? Um, it's not a lie. He's not really being threatening. He's dodging the issue. So let's say Edge. Was he able to dodge the issue by throwing it back on her? Plus two with this compel. Two to a six against a seven and a six. It is a strong hit. So, yeah, he does. Um, he does manage to, to throw it back at her. She's still shaken. She's still shaken from the fact that they were just hanging off the buildings then. She just saved him from dying. Um, this is not what she thought she'd be signing up for. So she's just a little bit shaken. And when he throws it back at her, saying that the population of your own city is scared of you, um, she doesn't really quite know what to say at this stage. The adrenaline is still pumping. So she kind of backs off a little bit. Mr. Race, our country is not perfect. I know that. The city is not perfect. I know that. But this city is ready to welcome the poor and the huddled at the drop of a hat. And we may not be perfect at accommodating those people all the time, but we're trying. We're trying damn hard. So if you don't mind, please keep your old world prejudices to yourself. I love this city. And I'll do my all to make sure its people are safe. I would be lying to you to say that I care about any of the citizens in your city. But one of our own British citizens are dead. And the suffering in that man's voice was real. It was not right. You just have to trust me. I trust you. I, I clearly trust you with my life. I owe you my life. Trust me. You will get to the bottom of this. Oh yes, I will get to the bottom of this. Even if I have to go over your dead body to do so. And with that, let's call that a wrap. My goodness. Um... Stealth mission, who knew? So what did we learn this episode? Uh, we learned that there is a connection between Mark Colden and uh, this mysterious shaved headed lady. We found her name and uh, we discovered that at least the alias she's going by is uh, Margaret Mayhern. So Margaret Mayhern has a connection to Mark Colden. That's very suspicious. Um, of some sort, we don't know. They mentioned a she in the conversation. We're going to assume that the she is, is her. We don't know that. It might not be. But we're going to assume that there's a connection between uh, Janet Mahern and Mark Colden and this third mysterious person who is afraid, who is, is, is experiencing hate. He's experiencing hate to the point of death. Some sort of persecuted person. But yeah, this individual... Uh, they're male, um, they have a bit of an accent, but we don't know why, but for some reason they, they are fearful for their very life because of hatred um, in the city of New York. And apparently Mark is trying to help them out, and Janet is trying to help them out, maybe? What is all this about? And what does Templeton have to do with all this? How is Templeton evolved? He's just some random Brit. Or is he? I don't know. Quite a lot. Okay, so we'll call it a night there. Scene four done. Stealth mission. A city full of hate that's recently had its alcohol taken away from it. Is that a good thing or a bad thing? I don't know. We'll have to find out next time. Thank you so much for joining. 
Good night. Thank you again for watching. This is the part of the video where I do ask you to like and subscribe if you enjoyed what you've watched. Uh, but I would also like to draw your attention to some awesome people doing some excellent things. The Cancer Council Australia is an organization that is striving for a future without cancer. What they do is they raise funds for uh, cancer research. They also spread awareness and empower people to reduce their cancer risk. They are a charity most famous for their Daffodil Day. However, they are willing to partner with all sorts of people uh, to do anything they can to raise money to help create a better future. If you'd like to find out more, go to cancercouncil.com.au or you can call them at 13 11 20. If you live outside of Australia, can I encourage you, seek out organizations who are also trying to create awareness or fund cancer research so that we could all live in a brighter future. So I'm not getting paid to say these things. These are just good people doing good things in this world and letting you know how you can be a part of it. So uh, if these people's work grabs your attention, can I encourage you, uh, go to Google, look them up, visit their website and see what you can do for this excellent, excellent course.